one o'clock, and so I will call this meeting to order. Uh, as Chairman Hartgrove is not with us in person, she's asked me to chair the workshop uh, in the meeting in her absence. Casey Griffin on our staff will call the roll. Casey. Mr. Collins. Mr. Darnell. Mr. Eby. Mr. Edwards. Mr. Ferguson. Mr. Hamby. Mr. Jensen. Ms. Kim. Dr. House. Mr. Morrow. Madam Chairman. Here. Vice Chair. Chairman, you have eight members present. Thank you, Casey. I declare that a quorum is present and we are duly convened. I also de further declare that Mr. Gordon Ferguson is excused. Pursuant to Section 8 of Policy 1.400, the board's meeting policy, workshops are meetings of the state board sitting as a committee of whole. Section 1, subsection E of the same policy in accordance with TCA 844 requires all votes taken during electronic meetings of the board or meetings when one or more member is participating remotely be taken by call of the roll. In accordance with this policy of the law, I move that the state board dissolve itself into a committee of the whole for the purposes of conducting our workshop. Is there a second? We have a second from Mr. Edwards. Uh, Mr. Griffin, will you call the roll for this motion? Mr. Cobbins, Mr. Darnell, Mr. Eby, Mr. Edwards, Mr. Ferguson, Mr. Hamby, Mr. Jensen, Ms. Kim, tomorrow. Madam Chairman Hargrove. Aye. Chairman, you have eight ayes. Thank you, Casey. I declare then that we are in the Committee of the Whole for the purposes of conducting our workshop. Before we go into the agenda, I would like to welcome everyone here. I also uh, ask our Executive Director if she has any up upfront comments. Not much for me. I'm excited to dig in. We've got some interesting presentations from the National Center for Assessment, from some of our colleagues at the State Department. Um, so I expect it to be a good, fruitful conversation this afternoon. We do. Uh, Miss Chairwoman Hartgrove, but so glad you're joining us via WebEx. Um, thank everybody for being with us. Thank you. Yes, we do miss uh, Chairwoman Hartgrove, and uh, I will try to do the best I can, but I know I won't be able to do as well as she does. So. And if you would allow me to thank you publicly, Vice Chairman Eby, I thank you so much for filling in for me. I regret that I cannot be there in person, but I'm certainly thankful for the opportunity to join you all remotely. So thanks so much. So we'll the agenda and the first item that we have is Center for Assessment. Identify yourself. Yes, sir. All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished members of the board. We're, I'm very grateful to, to be here. Um, I promise I'll do a proper introduction to my organization and uh, myself and my colleague, um, uh, Will Laurier. Uh, it's, it's just a pleasure to be here. I was joking with some folks before the meeting. Um, it's been a long time since I've not been in front of a bunch of Zoom squares, so it's good to, good to be interacting with humans. It's good to be in the room with all of you and uh, invited to, to share some remarks today. Um, and uh, there's two primary questions that we hope to speak to today. We're going to talk a little bit about reporting assessment results in light of some of the challenges in the pandemic. And we're going to talk a little bit about some advice we have about analyzing. Colleague Will and I tag team that. Um, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit of um, who our, or what our organization is. So the Center for Assessment, that's our full name, the National Center for the Improvement of Educational Assessment. Most people call us the Center for Assessment or the Center for short. Uh, we're based out of Dover, New Hampshire, which is where I'm based. Um, and there's 13 professional associates. So you've got two of them here today. You've got 15% of our capacity right here in the room. Um, 
uh, we work with uh, uh, 35 states currently um, in various ways through things like technical advisory committees and uh, some targeted technical assistance in other ways. Um, but uh, fully, uh, we have about 80 projects right now. Um, we also work with organizations like CCSSO and um, we work with some districts such as uh, Chicago Public Schools, uh, Gwinnett County, Georgia. Um, we work on grants and other kinds of projects. So we try to stay busy in the space of, as you see here in the slide, uh, helping with the design, implementation, and validation uh, assessment and accountability systems. That's primarily in service to large scale systems that satisfy requirements of ESSA, uh, ESSA, but we again, we also work with some districts that operate under those. Another thing I like to tell folks about our organization that may not have a deep familiarity with us is that uh, we're committed to open access and all of our ideas in our work. Not a commercial organization in the sense that we have proprietary intellectual property. I like to joke with folks that if you have a good idea that's gonna help improve assessment accountability and help kids learn and achieve, and you wanna keep it a secret, uh, don't tell us, because we're gonna tell everybody. We're all about uh, distributing good ideas, really helping the practice of assessment and accountability. Look here. Telling me I'm denied. While we're working on that, I'll, I'll, my next slide is, is just to tell you, um, oh, perfect, yeah. I was gonna say, I do know this. I do know how to tell you about myself without a slide. Um, so I was prepared to go on, but not too deep into the slide deck. Um, so I've been at the center since 2008. So I've been there a few years. Prior to that, I was the associate superintendent at the Georgia Department of Education, so, uh, which is where I'm from. I'm, I'm born and raised in Atlanta, so if you, Hear me say y'all, and you say, wait, I thought this guy was from New Hampshire. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's the things working there. Um, uh, some of the things I work on, I work with the accountability systems and reporting. It's a state collaborative. We've got about 40 states involved in that through the Council of Chief State School Officers, serve on a number of state technical advisory committees. Uh, and then like many of my colleagues, I uh, primarily distribute ideas through publications, presentations, and projects. I'm gonna pass the baton to my colleague, Will. Let him introduce himself, and he's actually gonna take into the first chunk of content, and then you'll get me back. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm Will Laurier, and um, I've been with the center since uh, 2019. Um, and uh, previous, previous to this, I worked in some of those places that do keep proprietary information about testing. I um, uh, worked at Pearson, North Star, ETS. Uh, uh, most uh, director of the assistant. Um, I currently serve on a couple of technical advisory committees. One, um, uh, both related to English assessment, and um, uh, like uh, like Chris, uh, at the center I work with state charter management organizations and other organizations that work on innovations, um, uh, help them with series of, series of action related to their assessment system. As Chris mentioned, in today's presentation, um, we're dividing it into two. One uh, relates to promising practices for communicating assessment results. And, and um, the other one has to do with the, the kinds of analyses that uh, can be conducted uh, to better understand the impact of uh, COVID-related on students. So I'm gonna start with the, the first. Um, assessment. Uh, to begin, um, I think many of us are familiar with the challenges uh, uh, this year. Um, in in uh, some states, um, not not necessarily, um, um, there have been there, some states have modified their test content, uh, focused on part standards or reduced test forms. There have been some standard administration additions. Um, I think almost universally, all states have expanded their testing windows. Um, and those, um, 
those changes are factors that affect the patient. Um, and those changes together with individual level changes, which are harder to verify, like changes in opportunity to learn, uh, changes in steps related to communication, affect individual or interpretation. And the third kind of uh, challenge are those that affect, um, that, that, that operate at the group level. Um, reduced participation, um, especially if and any participation rate, um, because we don't know the reasons why, we don't always know the reasons why um, uh, students who didn't test didn't test. Um, and any group differences, participation rates, or any of the prior um, tests or individual those would affect group uh, test score use. So to, to address these challenges, um, uh, these challenges have implications for, for reporting. Um, uh, most of us at the center, all of us at the center, uh, strongly advise against state results for high stakes purpose summary level. I have an asterisk next to that because um, I think in assessment, special case or special consideration. Um, I believe that summary, well, we know that summary results based on non-representative tested groups can't be applied to the full population. That's, um, that's an important consideration, especially when participation rates have, have changed uh, from prior years. Um, longitudinal comparison of trend and growth um, are going to be influenced uh, by the degree to which data are comparable and complete, and also within year comparability at multiple um, uh, uh, school and school, the district are also influenced by the degree the data are complete and comparable. Uh, we have a couple of sets of uh, public reporting recommendations. Um, this, this part includes things to I consider certain features and some uh, some caveats to add um, in reporting initiatives. So if conditions don't support a given comparison, then some of the problematic features that may show up in reports and typically show up in in uh, test uh, report releases are um, data displays that encourage a longitudinal comparison. Um, so. Um, and also explicit comparisons within and across the reporting level state. Um, those, um, uh, it would be a good idea to remove those if the conditions don't support those particular. Um, recommend adding context or caveats to support, such as, um, Presenting participation and enrollment advance or together with for both of those things, um, including uh, and including about limit interpretation. Um, if not comparable to prior years applies, then um, this is this is a caveat that that um, it would be uh, prudent to put in a, in a report. The other set of uh, recommendations is to consider uh, initiatives that you may not have done before or um, may not have done so uh, extensively, such as support to accompany media release, uh, having uh, media on the results, um, specific guidance on, appro on a appropriate interpretation or use and use, especially if it differs from prior years and uh, resources for parents, educators, um, and others, and also reports of special studies, which um, uh, we'll, we'll discuss um, uh, now. <laughs> yeah. Back over to Chris.
Thanks, Will. And I'm, I'm just going to extend one point that he made. Um, well, actually, let me, let me just add two things. Um, one is um, he mentioned uh, importance of context with enrollment and participation data. Uh, we some states are releasing that in stages. Um, they're releasing the participation and enrollment data prior to leasing. Give the field an opportunity to absorb that information. about trends in student achievement. So by uh, the uh, point about you have some time space there, which accomplish some of these counselors report. Um, but we've got, um, and I'll end with this, but uh, we do have explicit uh, documents on our website, ncs.org, anyone about uh, recommendations for reporting, even in some sample language to use to accompany a report, if that's of interest. And Will says, if you want to do it, I've uh, got some documents that uh, some of us have worked on. So as Will mentioned, we're going to switch to um, talking about uh, analysis of data, having the mode now, helping support decision making and planning when it comes to, hey, how can we understand the impact of the pandemic? How can we use that uh, to inform our, our initiatives and clinical? We're going to start with some, some guiding principles. Well, uh, cover. Uh, by the way, I think we'll, we, we plan to go about half an hour. We're half an hour. We, we, we hope to have time for your questions. So at any, any point, but certainly. Um, some of those principles, um, higher level analyses are going to be more trustworthy than lower level. Obviously, that's not a new insight in the pandemic. That's a good practice for um, uh, achieving a higher level of certainty anytime supporting decision making with data analysis. Uh, but we think it's particularly important in a simply means nothing more complicated than state level or district level, trustworthy than, say, student group, school level. Um, so as you uh, draw down uh, the unit of analysis, your ability to make it. Um, as Will mentioned, um, with reporting, the same holds true. It's really important to clarify who's missing in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, who participated in the assessment, um, whether there are shifts in enrollment. Um, all this in some states with the lower grades or patterns. So anytime you have a population shift, that's just going to cloud any interpretation that you're looking at. Context matters, um, exploring comparisons and interaction, and I'll unpack that a little bit uh, with respect to code, maybe attendance, um, any accompanying information that you have uh, to better understand those achievement patterns. And another principle that just really holds true in any context, but we wanted to understand in the present context, it's always a good idea to validate, particularly if you're making high decisions, such as deployment of scarce support resources. You have uh, some basis of assessment data, maybe you have some survey data, maybe you have qualitative information. When all of those things come up together, you've got your strongest case to support high. So some key questions that we think should guide any thoughtful analysis plan, and here I'm drawing um, from a, a paper that my colleague Damien Edebenner and recovery. Um, we really think these questions of who, what, and how much, all in service to implications for support, it's a good way to think about an analysis. Nothing too complicated here. By, by who we simply, what student groups being this past, you know, abilities, economic. Also, a good idea to look by academic groupings. That could be things uh, such as students who are low proficient with our previous test results versus those who are at proficient or even advanced levels. Um, so, looking at that, not assuming that the impact is uniform, looking at different places in the district is always a good analog. Um, and certainly, any uh, actual units. 
um, a sensible way to better understand. Um, and then the next question is, um, in what areas? Um, this could be content areas, language arts, mathematics, maybe domains for assessment. Put a caveat there, um, large scale assessment subscores are notoriously unreliable, and so I would really simplify uh, our advice about triangulating those kinds of data, you know, corroborating it with other information. Um, but I'd look at it. Uh, I'm mean, why you're collecting by domains. And that, again, if you're doing it at a high level, corroborating it for uncertainty. Uh, you can also look at various conditions, and I'm going to unpack that a little bit more later. Or uh, where are the degree of impact is, is what we're getting after and the how much. Do this in a couple different ways. Uh, shifts in percent proficient, mean scale scores. We strongly advocate for using scores. We know that the throw scores with missing data, missing large scale assessment data. 2020, um, but there are methods uh, of skipping the growth that uh, can be able to understand progress patterns. Talk uh, some other information. Um, and uh, really important to, to have a baseline. Reason. So all of that we hope is in service to what are the implications. This area where it's going to be the highest priority. How can we monitor recovery? In many cases, that for no other reason, uh, analysis in 2021 with state assessment data is going to be. People have expressed skepticism about the value of state assessment data, and uh, we understand cautious. In fact, no need from now um, talking about all these important cautions. Uh, appreciate that. But we also believe that these data can be leveraged for a useful purpose, uh, and if nothing else, just to understand so they can responsibly model what recovery is going to look. That's something that might go into some level of detail to something like uh, something like a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery. Uh, what's that going to look like? Important to have the data. Uh, Available to another paper you can get on our website, and I'll just speak to very generally the topic of analysis. Um, my colleague Michelle, um, that just lays out some advice for an analysis. We put together uh, these categories. I just spoke about the baseline. That's something that honestly uh, states don't need to wait for 2021 to do. You can look at your legacy data. Some additional categories when those data first come in, uh, in, in this moment now, or is on the cusp of uh, being in that position, uh, receiving those assessment data. Uh, first thing any responsible analyst would do is to uh, get some descriptions to understand what their status and crossing that with Coleman and attendance data. Other factors, these are just examples here, like access, learning demographics. So uh, some initial descriptives, uh, place to start. Then um, crossing that with other uh, categories, data you have, um, cross tabs, tables, correlation, category of analysis, assessment results cost, factors of time. See some of those. And then the um, uh, final category that cohort analysis, really looking at changes for, um, for match students across years. Literally a panel matching students, third grade and fifth grade. of cohort analyses. And a 
tried to um, just give a little more detail to this in subsequent slides. I promise I won't read all this here. Uh, and if you just break this down into status and progress, uh, that analysis uh, suggests uh, Bill talked about with reporting and then in it, we understand who participated, who did participate, how their performance on that five ten point by uh, by group, by learning mode, by school district. There are, I'll just, uh, and then you'll have this third bullet on that second row there. Wouldn't advocate this for reporting, but for special studies and analysis, there may be ways to statistically deal with uh, pockets of data. This is in Ohio. Estimating some samples, um, have the confidence intervals to say, well, we don't know, but then we have a school where 65% of the students participate. What, what's likely to have occurred? To impute data or put together a confidence interval, again, I don't advocate that for reporting. I think it can be interpreted and misused, but we think for special studies to get at a range of potential achievement, um, it could be out um, what achievement patterns uh, in terms of progress uh, this is the analysis there's there's a couple ways to think about this either growth or or looking at a trend would be uh, the same level of analysis third grade reading across years. Growth referred to cohort either by. As I mentioned earlier, skippier growth estimates could be useful for that purpose. Um, pairing growth rates pre and post I think is very important to do. Just producing crossing that available from prior years. Uh, some folks may be familiar with Joe, he's a Harvard back in the PC side of the industry. Uh, test score metric for and he talks about uh, their trend and equity check. I'm happy to unpack that whatever detail the board is really about um, looking at any unit where they're Missing data and finding a finding the checking for just the students that tested and looking at the patterns are going back into legacy data and say what were prior rates of achievement for another group of students that had similar characteristics to get a sense for if we don't have everybody who do we have and how do we know how that group compared to previous groups and the complement is what Ho calls the equity check to say well, let's account for the students don't have included in it and do the same thing. Let's find what, uh, uh, how those students performed in prior years, that information. There are some clever ideas. I'm almost done, and then we're happy to open it up to any questions from the board. Or, or we, we would just uh, we want to emphasize that focusing on what occurred is much more important than why. In fact, I would argue that why is really going to far. Nothing we talked about today is uh, what I would call causal claims. So I think it's very important. This is what we've observed. Um, it requires much stronger evidence about why that should be higher level analysis. Um, we also think it's really important in both messaging and putting together analytics prospectively instead of retrospectively. Consider how that how information will be used. Form supports moving forward. 
In fact, one of my colleagues at the center will say, every time we talk about state of health, words should come out of our mouth. We should always talk about it from the standpoint of we're interested in this because we're interested in helping to improve the state of Tennessee. We're interested in implication. Help us deploy to planning. We're not interested in armament. Interested in being helpful and power analysis way that should provide some sort of I'll, I'll end with this uh, uh, website, which I mentioned earlier. We've got a ton of resources for pulled up uh, uh, in our offices during the pandemic and not traveling as much. We did a lot of writing. Um, so uh, you can go to our webpage and you can see some of these reports. There's a lot more, including a lot of blogs. So they're not blogs and other things. States about issues related to. information. Happy to address any questions. But Dr. Mulaski and Dr. Laurier, uh, questions for them. Yes. Yeah, Alyssa, did you? can be recorded and people can hear outside. Hello. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, so that was awesome. I, I, I love this kind of information. Um, so all of it feels very rational to me like super measured, smart to me, focused also on the prospective versus the retro, which I think is a very important distinction because, I mean, pandemic, I mean, what is there to retro on that? You know, I mean, move forward, like, and think about, the, I love the supports in conjunction with talking about the data and likely interventions. Um, on your site, do you have, or, or can you tell us a little bit more about what that, a few samples, of like what 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 might be a prospective assessment of what's happening rather than a retro because no one's interested in casting blame you know like or i'm not like um that's a great question and i i, I think the, the analyses that i think have the most are are looking at growth rates where they support that so what rates of growth the tennessee observed this year and comparing that for growth rates of um, some states to help them do just that now. Uh, I think the way you would use that prospectively is you would say, um, based on what we're seeing, what kind of recovery pattern in time is it likely to observe? That might create a category for you. Does this elevate um, you know, students or these group of schools for priority support? Or it tells us that business as usual support activities um, may work here, but almost certainly won't work here. And so I think I, what I would do is, is bring those kinds of analysis to show what kind of growth rates and achievement patterns you're seeing. Really identify where the magnitude is going to be most substantial and to help guide support deployment. I have a couple of questions too. First, uh, I totally agree with what uh, Ms. Kim was saying with regard to the perspective versus the retrospective. Um, but what are you seeing, or, or maybe it's not you, and maybe we're going to learn more here in the next category, but generally nationwide, I assume what you're looking at is learning loss. Uh, what, 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 are, what have you seen nationwide? With I'll offer a few reflections. It's almost certainly going to be unsatisfactory because we're just at the cusp, and I, and I know of a few things that aren't public yet, so I can't speak to that. Will, if you have anything to add, I'd welcome you to ask. 
Um, you know, early on, before state assessment data were um, even being discussed, or before even we knew with, uh, whether there'd be much participation, you probably saw some of the commercial providers went out with some studies, um, uh, groups like NWA Math and Renaissance. Uh, uh, Will did some writing on this, so he may have perspectives to offer. Um, at that time, I, I don't that their findings showed that there was a high degree of alarm, but many of us at the center felt like um, those studies really investigate very the same kind of data. Didn't test it under what standards. So we think that state assessment data is going to show some much richer picture of achievement patterns. Um, the only state I know of that, so, so anyway, let me just close the loop on that. So I would say um, put an asterisk next to those commercial studies. Um, I think they were preliminary in my view, didn't do a deep enough dive in of the set, of the data set and the conditions under which. Although some people might regard my own. Um, but with state assessment, the only state that I know has publicly released is Texas. I, I can't cite all of their findings from memory, um, but their results do show some um, fairly substantial um, Um, were they were they stronger in um, uh, Texan and language arts? I, mean, I think. Larger increase uh, performance of hello there. at their lowest level. Um, they also saw dips in both of the subject areas across all, all groups. Not the same level, but all, all groups had um, uh, again, I have to put an asterisk next to that because um, uh, the participant, you have to whether with the participation rate and uh, modifications and uh, what kinds of changes was that why one of your early slides you said not to use summary level data if I read it correctly is that because of uh, not having a complete cohort of participants or across right yes okay. right because they, they uh, you m and and this um, and this really was one of the problems with the interim test with uh, uh, results that the, the um, interim providers um, first of all they they were reporting results on uh, only those schools and districts that purchase their, and use their products, right? Um, but they also uh, could not reach all the students for all the schools. And so even in the comparison to, or in the claims about a, a drop or a difference in a drop between math and ELA, uh, they um, really need to take that, that who's missing into account. Um, Another question is generalizability to the entire state. And here you have that because you have a state testing program, everybody is, uh, but not, not with the interest. Excuse me, there's more questions. Think about, I, I get conceptually like, okay, avoid longitudinal graphs perhaps, you know, because it, it might be misleading. You could caveat it, but people take away the wrong takeaways. I, oh, although you look like you maybe are like backing. Well, that's how I interpreted that point on the slide. So maybe I'm off on that, but I, I, I sort of got that. Like it, it can be dangerous. The, so yes, caveat it like crazy, do all the smart things. Um, and I'm wondering though, like, is it some, I don't know how to phrase this exactly, because that is always the easiest way is, you know, it's just like when you're comparing apples to apples, of course, like 
it's easy to see how you stand. When we, are, when we have apples and oranges, it's very difficult. And so I'm, my basic takeaway from all this is that, okay, you have to do all these like special analyses and that's, that, I mean, that's it in an apples to oranges world. Yeah, that's it. Let me, just if you can clarify some of the points you made and I'll certainly jump in here if I say anything that extend or even dispute. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I, so, so first of all, I wouldn't necessarily assume, and I feel like we'll make this point, that um, uh, comparisons longitudinally aren't supported. Our point is simply just that do the homework to ensure that if you're going to make those kind of comparisons, if you're going to do things like trend graphs and the like, that, um, that there's a strong basis for that. There's essentially going to be factors that would inhibit comparison. Be uh, something related to changing in administration conditions. From what I understand about Tennessee, and I don't have, I don't claim to have a deep understanding. Um, I don't think the state did anything like changing test forms or doing remote administration or anything like that. So that's not likely to be a high source. Uh, I may not have all the information, so if I'm wrong, somebody will correct me. Um, so uh, there could be uh, another source could be dips in participation rates, which we've talked about at length, right? So we just don't have everybody in the data file, so we can't either generalize this year or meaningless across years. But you may say, hey, we got a lot of districts and schools where we had full or almost full participation. So check, we're okay there. Our point, point is do the homework, check it out, and make sure because everybody's instinct naturally and defensively is going to be um, to be skeptical about those comparisons. So either uh, do the scrutiny to say, we don't think the comparisons are supported, and for that reason, we're eschewing it, and we're not just doing it as a talking point, we're actually not gonna do it from a department perspective. Like, if we're saying don't compare, you're not gonna go to our website and see side-by-side -side graphs. Like, we're gonna talk the talk and walk the walk. Or you can say, hey, we've done the diligence, and we think comparisons are, are supported. But then all of that is distinguished from a different set of advice, which is, and that's why we separated reporting from analytics, because we think it's a lot of states are going to be in the position, I, I suspect Tennessee is going to be one of them, where you can say, we have some concerns widespread about comparability to prior years, but we still want to get as smart as we can about it to understand achievement as deeply as we can to do all this prospective support. And that's where you get into the stuff that technical guys like Will and I like to do, like, um, it, doing some sampling or putting together some confidence intervals or understanding what the potential impact of missing data is. But my point of view here is simply, I wouldn't do that for a public report. I just think that's going to overwhelm folks and I think they're unlikely to take away the point. I would do that as part of a special study that the department or partners could release with all the appropriate guidance for interpretation and use. So I said a lot of things. But your question was so good because those distinctions are nuanced and I get it and get lost. So. so most of my questions have been asked, but I also just want to say thank you because this is exactly the conversation I was hoping to have. I think it really gives us the right frame as we go into the data that we'll be getting back as a state here in a, a week or two. Um, and so I had Elise's question. I also sort of further have a question about growth because I understand what you're saying now more clearly about the longitudinal kind of caveats. but particularly in a state like ours that uses EVOS or TVOS, you know, and we do that student to student comparison and we sort of have a model that accounts for that. How would you help us think about what our growth model is going to be able to tell us and what limitations specifically TVOS might have? And then my second question, and this may tee up another uh, trip to Nashville for you two, but <laughs> the practical implications for a board like ours as we look ahead and think about assess assessment as related to accountability systems and sort of, again, looking forward and thinking about the implications long term, what are the, the things that we need to be thinking about in terms of accountability systems. But that's a bigger question, I recognize. Those are two excellent questions. And, and, and just to note, the questions aren't getting easier as we go. <laughs> it's like an adaptive test you guys are dialing around. No, these, these are excellent, excellent questions, and I, I appreciate them both. Um, yeah, I, so I, I'm not a TVOS expert, um, so I don't know a lot about TVOS. Um, but, I, but I know enough um, about growth models in general to, to know that there's going to be a set of assumptions that going to be important to check in order to responsibly report. I, what I suspect you're going to find is uh, there might be some conditions where you feel more comfortable putting those uh, reports out or producing those TVOS estimates than in the end where participations are high, where enrollment patterns are stable. Uh, and, um, 
it's almost certainly going to be some areas where you feel like there's going to be some gaps and you'll need other ways to get at progress or estimate the of changes in those dimensions that, that we talked about. So I just, I guess my only comment there is it's almost certainly not going to be a uniform solution when it comes to academic growth. And, um, and I just think being clear about uh, what the likely impact of either violating those assumptions or dealing with those missing data is going to be the most important place of emphasis um, for those data. But that really kind of takes us into the next question, which is right on. I mean, it's sort of the question that I think states right now. As many states are saying, all right, we're living in 21, sort of understand where we are with assessment and accountability, but next year is where we're really starting to get weak in the knees thinking about what we're doing. Um, and, you know, because it's uh, accountability systems are built on piles of multi-year data, uh, not just academic growth. And is it indeed for a baseline this year? So um, I don't know the Tennessee accountability system deeply, but I'd be surprised if it doesn't have things that we see in other systems like banking and managing, you know, these kinds of things that, that, that suffer from disruptions in data. So, I mean, the, the glib expression I've been using is that a return to accountability is going to be more like a dimmer switch than a light switch. We see more of a transition phase than an all or nothing. At the center, we've had conversations with the U.S. Department of Education about some of our recommendations. Um, we think that states are going to right to advocate for flexibility. My, my supposition is that states will almost certainly need to uh, classify uh, schools for support in federal categories next year, unless the U.S. Department of Education surprises me and relaxes that. Um, but, uh, but I think the methods for doing that are almost certainly going to take a transitional phase before they're fully restored. And, and it also may mean that those systems are characterized by more flexible ways of doing that. So well, different categories of schools and districts based on the integrity of the data to support those decisions. So whereas accountability systems are typically one size fits all, they're often characterized by these composite indices. Uh, states in 22 may find themselves saying, uh, well, we have an accountability approach that fits schools in this condition versus another that fits schools in this condition, and we've got a phased-in way to get back to a place where we can have comparability across the board. With the Just to be sure, a lot of questions left to, to, to the department's credit, the U.S. department's credit. Uh, folks I've talked to are quite aware of these challenges and are seeking input from the field to bridge that. But Talking too much, Will, sorry. <laughs> comes out could easily be misused. One of the challenges I think we're going to have is how do you communicate that to the person on the street, what the real meaning is, what we get from it, what we can learn from it, what we can take forward prospectively to help our students. That's the challenge. Do you all put together a presentation like that? <laughs> one, uh, one thing that occurs to me is FAQ style, you know, um, uh, uh, you know presentation that has, um, um, you know, questions related to uh, uses that are not supported, right? I mean, you just say it. No, you can't use this for. Uh, <laughs> can I use these results for you know um, uh, classifying schools into um, you know, or ranking schools based on on their overall? And you would discourage that. You say for the reasons why. So that's that's one uh, you know uh, recommendation um, that, that that occurs to me. Sort of a, a platitude that people in our field uh, speak to often. When it comes to reporting, the, uh, the quip is you don't want to put information out there and hope people get the right interpretation. You want to lead with the interpretation. You want to put that above the fold. And, and so if you just put numbers out there and say be responsible, it's, it's, it's probably an impoverished theory of action that it's going to work well. But I think if you, know, if you just lead with the message um, and, you know, 
think let that characterize all your reporting initiatives, whether we're talking about an individual student report or we're talking about a state media release on the, uh, the achievement patterns of, of the state. I would, I would lead with qualitative information to say, our analyses show that these are the highlights and these are the things we care about moving forward and here's what we're gonna do about it. So people aren't left to go, oh, I see a lot of numbers, but take away from it. This is Lillian Hargrove. I do wanna jump in and, and thank everyone for your comments and the great questions and the presentation certainly resonates with me. Um, and I'm thinking about it from the lens of the State Board of Education is not, we're not typically the ones who are producing the reports. These would be coming out of the department. And so I know we have some of our uh, partners in the room from TDOE. I don't think the commissioner was able to be with us. And so I think we need to think about through that lens and how we communicate with them um, and, and ask uh, people like Casey Hogarin, who I believe is there today to present, what uh, would be the game plan from the department's perspective based on this presentation and the key learnings that came from your excellent presentation. So those are the things that are resonating with me and thinking about it from that lens, because we do have many stakeholders that would be viewing this information and could quickly jump to conclusions without really truly understanding the data. If we've not, as a state, done our due diligence with the release of the information and avoiding any uh, erroneous comparisons and the, the many things that you've mentioned in your presentation. So um, I, could, I could turn to Dr. Morrison or anybody on the board, board uh, to say, you know, what do, what do we need to do? What do we, should our steps be? And we can certainly ask Casey and others who are there from the department. Um, what their plan is with regard to taking this back to the commissioner and uh, having these conversations about next steps for the department before the information is released. And I'll stop talking to gauge any thoughts from, from you all, um, in particular, those from you at the Center for Assessment. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just say, I, the folks I know from the department, Casey and the whole team, it's a first rate department. You've got a very talented team and I'm, positive that uh, on, the, on the front foot with this. Also, uh, Will and I know many, many of my uh, colleagues on the Tennessee TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, my colleague, Mary Ann Perry, I think is the chair of that TAC. It's a first grade TAC. You've got great technical advisors. Uh, so you've got some, some real talent and sources of expertise um, already around you, so. Yes, there's no question about that. And of course, I, I'm, I'm not sure if they're hearing this particular presentation for the first time. So hearing it from you for the first time ourselves as board members, of course, when, until today, there was no way for me to know what kind of information has been shared with them. And I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We, we do have an excellent team at the department. So we'll, we'll dig into it with, with um, the team from the department. So thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much for informative and speaking of Casey Wren. Uh, our next topic is TDOE assessment updates and standards. So I think it's very appropriate. Good afternoon, board members. Um, I am excited to be with you today, both in person and um, to, to share some of the great things that have been happening across the state as we wrapped up our testing season and get ready to, to produce some of these results and reports for you all. Um, of course, testing is, is in our state is a fundamental to our strategic plan. Uh, it's part of how we think about um, meeting this promise that we have for students, that every single student in Tennessee, regardless of where they are, will have access to a high quality education. This is in part how we measure that and how we make sure that we are supporting each student where they are, um, but also the fundamental elements of our plan, ability, um, how we monitor our progress as a state overall. So over the next 40 minutes or so, um, together we'll talk about the impact of COVID, how that has actually changed the approach of our team at the department for the last year, um, the flexibilities that we gave for districts, um, and then what actually happened this spring as we as we did testing in person 
um, and then a look ahead to the school year. We'll also do a little bit um, talking about the standard setting that we've done that you will you will see me back tomorrow as we talk about approving the cut scores for science and social studies. Um, I know we've already talked about that with a subcommittee um, of the board, so we'll just do a, a short review of that. So what has what does this look like um, for us in the state with COVID? Um, we have had a lot of challenges, obviously, uh, important time frames in, in talking about our time with our students, right? We had schools that started later. Um, we have schools that remain virtual for a majority of the year. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're able to measure that time with our students appropriately. Um, we have an increased need for formative and diagnostic testing. Um, with the cancellation of spring 2020 testing, we came into this 19-20 this school year um, with a hole in some of our information in terms of what we knew about our students um, and this, this interruption in instruction in the spring that we also wanted to understand the impacts of. So we had an increased need um, for some, some non-summative testing um, that our team took on that, that was not something that the department is normally stepped into. Um, we also had a large requirement for more district flexibility. Um, heard about uh, us talking about one size fits all versus what a local community context looks like. We know that our communities across the state of Tennessee experienced COVID in drastically different ways. Um, how our large urban school districts reacted, how our small rural districts um, were, were experiencing that, and how that changed throughout the year. Um, so what school looks like on the first day of school for many districts, it did not continue to look like that um, as the ebb and flow of the school year. And so we really needed to make sure that we were um, putting in place some district flexibility um, to make sure we were able to test as many students as possible as safely as possible and get the most accurate data as possible. And of course, the uncertainty and variability around our instructional calendars, our modes of instruction, we're, we're, we run a, a, a large-scale um, standardized program. Um, large-scale and standardized was not how we experienced school this year. Um, and so we needed to make sure that, that those, that uncertainty and that variability around how our districts were, were operating, we were able to meet them where they were um, and make sure that we were able to. Um, so this is our, our past year. Um, here in Middle Tennessee, we obviously had a, had a double um, hit last March with both the tornadoes and the beginning of, of the COVID pandemic. And so many of the things that we were planning on doing, our online verification tests um, and the start of spring testing were impacted right away, um, which then has, has a ripple effect throughout the um, Through last spring and summer, um, we did a lot of things that we don't normally do um, in our, our summative assessment team. Um, so we halted work on, on 20, 2021 assessments and we started working on um, checkpoints and interim, brand new tests that we were able to deliver to, to students at the very beginning of school um, to see where they were, measure progress, um, and, me and give our, our educators from the very start of school something to look at to understand how to support their students in, in the environment. Um, we also launched a, a statewide formative testing platform, which again was first um, for us in the state, knowing that our educators were clamoring to have some information about how students um, on Tennessee specific standards aligned assessments um, rather than something off the shelf, um, as you heard, that, that might not necessarily align um, to what we're looking at. Today. Um, and then we had to think through how are we in going through our testing programs as we normally would um, for in reaction to what has happened in the spring. So our junior ACT testing that was canceled, for example, um, we had to very quickly put in place more options for fall ACT testing. Um, we opened up a second week, uh, window for WIDA, so our English learner testing in the fall as well, um, so we could accurately classify and support students that, that missed out on those assessments in the spring. And then going through a process of, of um, finishing out an RFP for our assessment development. We were very busy last summer, despite um, tests actually not happening last year. So we launched these programs, completed ACT testing, um, and then did our fall um, OC testing. So our TCAP end of course testing for high school, um, we did fall as we normally would, but again with the district flexibilities we offered those for that, that we were able to support our districts. 
so in January, um, we released our um, information for that fall window, um, started our preparations for spring, and launched again new formative, uh, including full-scale practice tests, interim tests, um, and new small testlets um, that we are able to give educators some additional information so they know where their students are in advance of that final um, summative testing. And then we also saw the, the special session um, with our General Assembly and what that they were asking us to look at as a department and as a state in terms of supporting our students. So this spring, um, we were able to test in a re as relatively normal as we could. That includes our English learning testing, um, MSIA and alternate testing for our students with cognitive disabilities, ACT testing, and of course our, our TCAP summative testing. We also, um, with the passage of the learning loss legislation, um, supported districts as they started their summer bridge camps, summer learning acceleration camps. Um, the department actually created and released post tests for those camps as well. Um, so if you look at the suite of, of things that our team is doing, besides just summative testing right now, um, we've really expanded that portfolio of more testing options for districts to get, to get as much information about their students. Um, and so where, where we are right now um, is wrapping up that summer students. Our, our last summer programs across the state ends next week. Um, we're developing additional formative work for next year and getting ready to do our final reporting for our TCAP results. So I mentioned our formative support. Um, this is something we, we, I spoke to the board about the last time we were together, but we've actually added even more um, since then. So our start of year checkpoints from last year was focused on math and ELA, um, in, and this is across all tested grades, so from third grade all the way through high school, um, giving our, our educators an opportunity to, even though they didn't have those spring 2020 test results, they could very quickly um, gauge where their incoming students were, what standards they may be missing out on, and be able to use a, a very um, on-demand acceleration model um, to say, okay, if this is a piece of information that they may be missing for me to, to start um, grade-level content, we really wanted students to be in grade-level content and not in a remedial group. And so those checkpoints were able to give us on-demand acceleration um, for those students to identify what they needed. Um, we released mock interim, so again, these are full blueprint aligned, full length tests um, that are aligned to TCAP. Um, our previous practice tests had been uh, not 100% um, in, in terms of what, what that alignment looked like, so this gives our students um, a, a real practice that's in a non-high stakes environment, gives our educators real data they can use that are, that are real TCAP um, items, and that are aligned to Tennessee standards, so not an off-the-shelf, something that's not going to match um, the rigor of, of our assessments and our, our items, but that match. Um, and open an item bank so educators can actually use former TCAP items to design tests themselves that they can use in their own. Um, and then this summer launched the pre and post tests for um, our summer programs as well. And so right now we have over 700,000 students that are provisioned today in our formative platform, which is SchoolNet. Um, and then at, and as, of, as of last week when we were preparing this presentation, um, over 360,000 formative tests had been taken in that platform in less than a year. So a, a lot of, of good information that districts are, are gaining. So when we're preparing for summative, um, heard uh, my colleagues from the Center of Assessment talking about what are some of the changes that states did um, to, to make sure that they were able to test this year. Um, for us, that we focus on getting as many students to test as possible. We wanted to make sure that we were able to support districts to do that safely. So we asked what they needed um, and then worked very closely with them one-on-one -on -one to do that. Um, we expanded the available use of off-site testing locations and the flexibility of testing schedules um, and training proctors and support folks. Um, we issued guidance on use of medical exemptions for COVID-impacted students, um, including le legal guidance to support districts who these were new, new conversations and, and new decisions for them. Um, we provided peer support um, and profiles from districts from the field who were doing things differently or doing things right. We were connecting um, peers across district lines to support 
um, because there is only one district testing coordinator in every district. They're they're doing this on their own, and we wanted to connect the dots to make sure we were supporting folks. And you also heard one of the things that many states said was expand the testing window. Um, one, this prevents uh, students from being impacted by a quarantine or a COVID diagnosis. Um, it's, you know, a two-week quarantine would take up the majority of our, our current testing window. And so expanding that, giving flexibility for make-up exams for districts, um, but also wanting to recognize that all of our districts did not start school on the same day. Um, we saw months difference, week difference in terms of a district to district how many instructional days that they were going to have prior to our testing window. We wanted that to be as comparable as possible. And so we provided different testing windows that aligned to those instructional cap, um, calendars to support districts from where they were coming in. Um, we also expanded our testing opportunities for WIDA and our alternate assessments as well as APT. Um, and I know it, it's not necessarily what, what I'll be talking about here today, but I'm incredibly proud of the APT push um, despite um, the legislature removing the requirement for last year for our juniors to take the ACT, um, we we are actually the one of the largest states in the nation in ACT testing during um, not as a percentage of students, like as in numbers of, of tests taken. Um, and for a, a state with a population like Tennessee, it's phenomenal, and it speaks to the, the amount of options um, that we worked. Uh, with our team at ACT to give to districts and also how hard districts work to get students into um, We allowed student makeup across windows. So despite the choice of window, we wanted to give flexibility for individual kids and provided um, a lot of different types of support, um, virtual trainings, virtual meetings, daily webinars. We had a daily webinar throughout an entire nine and a half week window. Um, so my, my team was very tired at the end of that, um, but they were also made sure that every single day, whatever question a district had, that we were there. Um, and increasing our efficiency. We issued new guidance documents this year, um, sample communication kits, and checklists, social media tools. Um, and this was really in support of our districts who were coming on and had never used some of these tools before because they didn't have to. Um, assessment is expected, students are expected to show up. Um, this year is a very different year, particularly with our districts who had a majority of their students um, at home in virtual education. Communicating with those families the value of bringing a student to, to the building to test um, was a very different conversation than we've had in past years. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were supporting adding those conversations. So what happened? What did it, what did it look like? Um, these are a few numbers um, that, that you all can, can look at. And, and these are the numbers on our dashboard that we review every single day. Um, over 600,000 essays scored by hand. Um, so we had hundreds, over 300 hand scores that were very quickly grading those constructed response essays um, for our students to be able to score their exams. Um, nearly 2 million answer documents this spring run through scanning machines to, to scan. What does that look like for, for our UPS and FedEx partners? That means tens of thousands of boxes um, across the state um, to, to fulfill orders for, for our districts. Um, and nearly 2 million tests taken this spring alone. Um, and despite the flexibilities that we provided to districts, um, our unanimous tip line that, that is there to support in case there are test security and concerns um, had zero calls. So even though we had that longer window, even though we had more flexibilities, we really do not have any concerns at this point um, about the quality of the administration and, and test security that we were able um, to about that, and that is, that is, all of that in, is in service to our district testing coordinators, our building testing coordinators, and our district leaders, um, who just did a phenomenal job um, of, of setting up um, testing this, this spring in order for, for students to be safely, um, for, for families to feel like that they had their, their questions answered. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy to, to stand up here and sing the praises of our district testing coordinators, because they did a phenomenal job. Um, districts took advantage of every single flexibility they offered. Um, so whether that was off-site testing and districts saying, hey, can I, I, I want to test in my local church, local community center. I want to test my virtual students at a different building than my, um, than my in-person learners. Um, I want to be able to provide makeup opportunities at a different testing window. Um, they took advantage of that um, in a way that they needed to. They increased communications with parents. 
Um, in fact, many districts set participation rate goals um, and very publicly did that in a way that, that challenged themselves, challenged their families, um, whether it was to sign a, a pledge to, to show up um, or to be a part of what was happening in a school built, uh, building. Um, which leads me to my next point, which is there was a lot of positivity and joy um, and celebrations around testing. Um, I, I monitor social media every single day when we're in a testing window um, for test security concerns, et cetera. And what I saw was a lot of joy. There were kids that had not met their teachers, meeting them for the first time. Um, there were kids stepping foot in a new building, whether that was their transition to middle school or high school, stepping foot in that building for the first time. Um, they were able to see their friends that they hadn't seen in a year. Um, and to celebrate the, the great um, participation that we were seeing at school to school um, and the joy of these teachers and, and students being able to be together again um, was not normally what, what I see on social media around. So it was, it was very exciting to watch. Um, and I will say our administration vendor has been incredibly flexible and accommodating with us. Um, so, you know, it, our contract does not say we will do four testing windows and four different sets of reports, but that's what we were able to accomplish. Um, and so they were incredibly accommodating of every single thing that we asked, um, whether that's wave shipments processing, the um, expanded hand scoring timeline, which means they were um, staffing very differently than they normally do, um, and a much earlier delivery of raw scores um, this year to support getting students into these summer programs to support the learning loss and acceleration. So we were able to deliver raw scores um, within two weeks of the close of every single window to make sure districts had initial information to, to prioritize students for their summer support. Um, but it wasn't always, always rosy, obviously. Um, we did have a significant number of students across the state who were in virtual instruction, which means they were not walking into a school building every day, and that's what we were asking them to do to test. Um, was to walk into a school building. So testing students in virtual in, um, instruction was a challenge for our districts to figure out how to communicate that with families, how to ensure safety of these students, um, and then how to make sure that, that they were communicate, communicating effectively when they weren't seeing people. Um, we also had significant impacts on staffing, um, COVID-related quarantine sicknesses, um, and for a lot of schools and districts that had policies around no volunteers entering the building. Um, proctoring looked very different this year. Um, administration looked very different this year for, for many of them. Um, we also had shipping um, challenges. You know, now that everyone's home and Amazon, we're, we're seeing a lot of, a lot more logistics coming through and shipping. And so we de definitely had to work very closely with our partners um, to mitigate challenges that we saw in shipping, delays, um, and they were impacted by, you know, COVID sickness and quarantine. And then increased materials order. So this year, if you're thinking about small groups, um, read aloud accommodations, et cetera, we saw an increase in that as, as districts were social distancing, their, their testing rooms, um, spreading out students. And so that required increase in orders that we did not. Um, and we learned a lot about offering four windows and doing a wave approach to scoring and reporting. Um, it was, we learned a lot about logistics that, that we are taking into um, future um, improvements and logistics, even if we don't do the multiple windows in the past. So uh, a lot of good lessons learned um, and a lot of impressive um, flexibilities, both by our district and by our vendor. Um, so what, what is expected for the year ahead? Um, we will continue to increase our formative options. I really liked that the Center for Assessment team talked about supports um, because that's where we will be and where we will continue. We're adding to that item bank. We're adding to our suite of testlets. Um, we are continuing to provide the pre and post test for our summer programs, which again, all of these are, are tests in addition to our summer information. Um, uh, and I assure you um, the consistent and consistency and quality of our summative testing program will remain. Um, both for our fall ESD, our spring PCAP next year, and we are continuing to push our vendor for faster and faster reporting of scores um, to support the important decisions. That we um, and we recently announced a transition back to online administration for our high schools for next year. So our high school EOCs will be back um, to computer-based tests um, for the 21-22 the school year. And we'll continue to, to monitor what that looks like for other grades and subjects for, for this. 
So um, I will say the, the team asked about, well, when will we be getting some of these scores? How are we thinking about score reporting? Um, you don't see a lot of actual results in this presentation. It's because we are doing quality checks on our comprehensive data files as we speak. That's what our psychometric team is doing back at the office right now, the full skull office. Um, we are anticipating releasing participation rate data first. Um, as you have heard, um, is, a, is a best practice, recommended practice um, across the country. So next week, please expect to see um, the comprehensive participation rate data for the state and district by district analysis. And then the following week, um, expect to see our CCAP results data um, as we dig in and set some, some updates um, about what that looks like. And I can assure you that our team has been looking at documents from the center, has been looking at documents and working with uh, our CCFSO collaborative. Um, I know the Andrew Ho paper that was, that was used, I've, I've spoken to Andrew multiple times about conducting these analysis and, and looking at not only who, who is in our data and what is our data saying, but who's missing. How can we estimate the impact and do that equity check? Um, and then also think what comparisons and, and longitudinal looks can we support because we feel confident in what we're seeing and then what do we not want to encourage folks to support. Um, so we will be releasing that data um, embargoed to our district this week, having some, some conversations with media as we prepare to release um, these two large releases in the next. So um, you will also see me again tomorrow um, to present um, our Tennessee Educator Committee's recommendation um, on cut scores for our new science and social studies exam. So this uh, standard setting overview um, is a conversation that I had with our subcommittee um, on testing and accountability earlier this year. I did want to do a brief overview here prior to you tomorrow um, in case you had any questions. Do you want to stop now? Yeah. Cool. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you for going through that. Um, I'm afraid a lot of my questions are probably ones where you'll say, you know, wait until next week and following. So that said, I mean, just are the kinds of things that we'll see when the participation rates are released, you know, how many LEAs in schools met the 85% participation rate, for example, um, the percent of overall potential test takers versus actual test takers, all of that broken down yeah. by demographics. That's when you talk about participation rate reporting. Yeah, absolutely. All that. So, um, According to the, the accountability hold harmless bill that was passed in special session, um, all negative impacts of accountability won't, will not be there for districts who met an 80% participation threshold. So we will be releasing um, what percentage of districts met that threshold in the full list of districts and their participation. So that will come next week. Um, we will also be talking about from a state level um, what that overall participation rate looks like, demographic representation of that, um, and then how representative that was of. Uh. And then again, I really appreciated Chris and, and Will kind of setting the framework for how we think about the data. It sounds like mm -hmm. you all are really thinking about how we report it responsibly. And I know this board will be eager to have conversations with you and your team. And maybe we'll think about September special called meeting or some next yeah. opportunity. We'll just think our next quarterly meeting is not till the end of October, which seems forever away right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think most of my questions will probably need to be. But thank you for this update in terms of what we can expect when. Other questions? Lisa? Yes, Daryl. So that's a, that's a term that we did not coin, but that was coined by Dr. Andrew Ho, um, that is really thinking about how, what do we understand about the students who took our exam? What do we understand about the students who, who might not have taken the exam? So there's two, two places to check there. One is thinking about enrollment. Um, how did enrollment change? And because we can, we can share a participation rate for this year, but if enrollment has significant actually is, is different if you think about a longitudinal. So enrollment is one piece. And or the students that were enrolled, that were registered to take the exam, what percentage of 
Um, and so in, in an understanding of that gap of who's not here, um, we want to understand is, is that missing, not random? Um, if, if there is a, a certain group of students who are more likely to be missed than not? Um, and then how did we expect those students would have performed had they taken the test? And, and does that potential performance, that projected performance, would that have changed in a way that changes so that, that's something to think about. We don't want to tell a story um, that, that is incomplete um, because a group of students. Question. Um, so you're going to report the data next week and pardon participation rate. One question I've gotten from districts is when are they going to get the data? Mm -hmm. the second question is, is uh, when you report the data, how are you using the information presented from Center for Assessments reporting that data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our districts receive raw scores um, in four different ways. And so all of our districts have raw scores now that, that came right after their administration window. Um, our comprehensive data file, which is the full um, data file that includes raw scores and scaled scores, so the scale, the final score and the performance level, um, is actually due to be shared to districts tomorrow with and after this board votes on, on final cut scores. So if those cut scores are approved, um, we'll be able to share the full suite um, of our data from the spring with districts. Um, and then following from there, um, we'll have about a week and then we'll be releasing aggregate um, and reporting uh, to districts, so our summary reports on their schools and districts. Um, and then um, at the end of next week, we'll be releasing information into our family portal so families and educators can log in see that data themselves. Um, printed um, information, printed student reports um, will be in the first couple of weeks of August delivered to schools. But schools will get their comprehensive data file hopefully tomorrow. So the appropriate caveats that uh, Center for Assessments talked about, will they get those at the time that that data becomes public to the families, et cetera, or are they just going to get results? Yeah, so I, I think it's important that districts get the, the full suite of results, right, because they need to digest and understand in terms of their context. Um, we will be putting out publicly participation rates from a statewide perspective next week and the following week uh, publicly a, a statewide summary of results. Um, we will include in that summary of results a lot of the, the information that's shared here, um, the context and caveats. And that was a decision too about releasing participation rates um, in advance was to help set that context. Um, but yes, we will be supporting districts, release, districts receiving that result with some additional information about what they're seeing, um, some tools around looking at that data um, and asking some of these same questions themselves that, that the center has proposed to us today. And, and one other question, when you report the data, will they be able to report those that were virtual class uh, and those that were in class? Will we see separate data in that way? So not in our assessment results because that data is not at our assessment vendor. Um, that is information that we are looking at at the state. Um, but attendance data and the type of, of class that a, a student is in, this is actually new information that, that we have not required from districts in advance of this year. Um, so we had a new attendance code. We're asking for, for that information from districts. Um, so we are looking at that information now. We will be be using it in analysis and understanding results, um, but that's new information that the district has shared this year. That's a new way for us to be cut. It will not be part of the public, the first public release. I understand last year obviously was unique from a standpoint of virtual mm -hmm. classes, but as we as a board looks at potential for virtual programs, virtual classes, I think that would be something that would be of value in the future to understand how people in the virtual classes compare to the Absolutely, that, that was the first question that the committee asked me as well in the fall. Casey, will we be able to do this? Um, so it's definitely a question that we're looking at internally. Other questions? Ms. Kim. That presentation, um, that was very helpful. But can you remind me what the timeline is around the ACT? 
for results or for? Yeah. yeah, so we will receive our statewide results this fall in terms of the, the past cohort. We typically do a release in the fall um, and then another release in the spring of, of cohort results. Um, because we do the, the senior retake, um, we typically don't release a graduation cohort ACT release until until that senior year. Yep. Okay. That, thank you. Um, and then this is totally uh, the, the test slips. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Can you remind me what's in the like wh where the content for the test slips come from? Yeah. So we're actually building those. These are very similar to PCAP items questions. Um, but they are much smaller tests. So they're five question tests, um, 10 question tests that are able to um, give a teacher a, a weekly end uh, or unit end check for her students. Um, those are actually based on Tennessee state standards. And we actually focus in on one or two standards a testlet. So they're, they're meant to be really customizable for an educator uh, as they're finishing a unit, as they're finishing a lesson. That they're able to go in and targetedly address those students. Okay. And then I think that the answer to my question, because the question, I, I was, I saw the more test slips, but it made me wonder how addictive they are. You could sort of, you know, and you could be looking at You're them. looking at that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have so, we've only, we released 11 in the spring. That was our very first um, group wow. that that's come, has come out. So we did math um, and ELA in one grade of science. Um, we have, see something more coming this this year um, across different subject areas so we'll be able to plug in for this part so standard setting um, tomorrow you will be receiving recommended cut scores for our science and social studies exam um, for those of you who don't um, live and breathe a large-scale summative assessment program, like my friend from the center, um, this is actually the, the, the life cycle of a TCAP test. Um, it's actually at three years long from um, when we first um, uh, decide on what our standards are and that this board does that, um, accepts our Tennessee academic standards. Um, how do we build a test that then is administered to students? Um, we build specifications and an overview or what we call a blueprint of that test. We then develop individual questions that are aligned to our standards. We test those questions first. See if those questions are actually measuring the thing we measure um, and that students um, perform on, on that, that, that question equally across the board, that, that no student is disadvantaged by any specific question. <coughs> then review the data from that, build an operational test, which is the real test that a student will be scored on, and give that test to students. And the last step is we actually ask the standard set, which means we look at um, that test that we built, um, we align it to the expectations of the standards, and say, what do we believe the scores are um, that are appropriate to label a student into a proficiency band or, or a performance level um, based on this specific exam. That we um, and then after we set those cut scores, then we can actually report um, scores to the field. So the, the standard setting process um, is a methodology used to define those levels of achievement. Um, so how a student is described um, in their results for the test, um, and we have to set cut scores in order to, to break up those, those performance levels. Um, and the cut score is simply the score that serves to differentiate students into those different levels. So what does that look like in the state of Tennessee? Um, we take the student expectations, that is the standard, what a student is supposed to know and be able to do according to what this board has set. Um, take the actual test itself, the questions that we ask, uh, how students responded to those questions, and then we take Tennessee teachers with real content expertise and have them evaluate those two things together um, to help us cut, set these cut scores through a standard setting process. In the state of Tennessee, our performance levels are, as, as you see on the screen, mastered, on track, approaching, and below, with the on track and master being our, our proficiency. So in that continuum of performance, 
the cut scores represent where a student will be um, and how they will, which performance level they will be. That those cut scores are on the edges of each of these performance phases in that continuum of performance from. So why are you seeing me today in July 2021 um, to do standard setting? Um, our revised science and social studies exams were in place um, in very well time um, in 2019-2020, which require standard setting to determine. Um, we revised our science standards back in 2016. Those were implemented in 2018. We did a field test year um, where we were testing out new questions um, to design the new standard, the new science test which means we had a beautiful new science test ready to go in 1920 um, when assessments were canceled. Um, we did a very similar thing with our social studies as well. This board review and re reviewed and revised those standards in 2019, and the test in 2019 was adapted um, to remove a constructive response item and also align to the So what did our standard setting process looked like. Again, I did a much uh, more in-depth conversation with the subcommittee on this, but I did want to present this to everyone in case you had questions for um, Originally, these, these things were scheduled to happen in summer 2020 with, with Tennessee educators. Obviously, we had to cancel those meetings um, because of the COVID pandemic um, and because the, the we decided to cancel. Um, so what we did was we conducted um, a two-part process for our standard setting this year. Um, we did a content-based standard set um, in November um, and conducted those meetings virtually. So we brought together um, teams of teachers in a virtual platform, um, and this included teachers from across Tennessee, a diversity of backgrounds, years of experience, um, and types of school districts that they represented. Um, we reviewed the fall and spring assessment questions in comparison to our state standards and also in comparison to those performance level descriptions. So the, what we believe to be true for a student who is in one of those performance phases. We utilized a, a well-known methodology called Angoff method, um, which is a, a method by which the, the teachers review each and every question in, in comparison to the standards and also to those performance level descriptors say, is a student who is falling in this bucket of performance, would that student likely get this question right? Um, and and conducting multiple rounds um, of judgments on, on those questions until they come to a full committee of what those cut scores need. Um, we then came back and reconvened a subset of those teachers this spring um, following um, the testing to make sure that they were actually looking at those cut scores a second time, um, that we were looking to understand what vertical articulation looked like across the grades, which means we did we wanted um, those performance to, to represent the same thing grade to grade, um, and that there wasn't different expectations on our standards for different grade levels of students. We're, we also convened a group of teachers to talk about our science alternate exam. Um, so this is our exam that is given to our students with the most significant cognitive abilities. Um, and because those students experience our assessment slightly differently, um, we wanted to make sure that we were presenting not just the content um, for those educators to review, but also what we call student profiles, which is actual um, an actual understanding of how a student could get to each cut score um, by how they answered the questions because our students were um, could potentially get to different levels of cut scores by answering different questions correctly and that our students, our, our educators are thinking really critically not just about the content but also about this special population of um, And so in looking, creating those student profiles we had to have real student data to look at um, and so hence those meetings happen just the past couple of weeks in July um, after testing, but before I'm standing in. Um, and so we will be bringing those recommended cut scores that came from those teacher um, to you tomorrow. Happy to answer any questions about that process um, or what you'll see tomorrow.
Casey. Process. Casey that's trying to identify how going about it. What are their target numbers they're looking for or whatever the answer is. What are they doing? So they, we don't actually walk in um, with the target number for them. Um, we actually generate that with the facilitation of that group. Of the first thing they do when they walk in is a really deep dive of our performance level. Um, and so the performance level descriptors of what does it mean to be mastered in the state of Tennessee? Well, that means you have um, this amount of content knowledge in this state. And who is deciding that? Yeah. Who? Great question. Um, so if we back up, um, we take those policy level, performance level descriptors that are the same across all subject areas and grade levels, right? So what it means to be mastered in the state of Tennessee. We have a sentence, right, that, that represents every grade level and subject area. We actually bring a group of teachers together to say, let's look at what this sentence could mean for a seventh grade science, right? And, and create performance level descriptors for each grade and subject area for each standard. So they're actually looking at our standards and they're saying, what would this performance on this standard look like at a master level, at an on-track level? If you were just below the standard, what could you do? And if you were not even approaching the standard, what could you potentially do? So they actually write those performance level descriptors and Tennessee teachers write those for each grade and subject area. That's one committee. We come back later um, with another committee and say, let's do a deep dive of those descriptions, right? So in seventh grade science, what a student who is on track should be able to do and what they should be able to know. Um, and then they write borderline performance level descriptions, which means for a student who is just over the edge of the on track cut, or just over the edge of the master cut. How does their performance look different than a student who is just under that cut? And they write those borderline descriptors. So we're getting incredibly descriptive narratives about what a student should be able to do, what questions they should be able to get right at every level of performance from the bottom to the top. And um, we actually go through and look at real test questions. We say, okay, you said a seventh grade student who is on track in science should be able to differentiate these two concepts. Here's a test question where they're able to do that. What percentage of kids do you think will get this right? And if a student got this right, do you think they should be in this class? So they go through a round of judgments where they're actually answering a question, yes or no? Would a, would a student who's on the borderline of on track get this question right? Yes or no? And so then they add that up and they say, well, for an on-track student, I answered yes 27 times, which means for me, Casey thinks the cut score for performance um, for on-track is 27. What does Mike think? Um, and then we facilitate a conversation where we're going question by question, determining that, and we do three rounds of that until the entire committee comes together to agree on what those cut scores are for All right, so uh, thank you. If you, once the work is done, would they, would by, they step back and they look at their computer, they say, and if I wanted to look, see if this person is go to the next level, Therefore, we have confirmed, validated our previous. Absolutely. Um, so your check's in the mail um, in terms of teeing me up for the next question, which is the last day of these standard setting meetings are called vertical articulation, in which 
all of the grade level committees get together and they look at how that cut score looks in each of the different grades. They ask themselves, would a student in this grade be ready to hit this level of performance in the next grade? Or are there discrepancies across grade, right? Are we expecting way more out of our seventh graders than we're expecting out of all of our other grades? So the final piece of this puzzle, which is one of the things that just happened in July, is we're actually looking at vertical articulation of those cuts across grades and thinking about the, the continuum of our assessment um, and the continuum of thinking. And then also, um, one of the things that we did was look at actual student performance on some of those questions to gut check if our committee's understanding and guess about the percentage of students that yes or no, get these questions right or wrong, um, to gut check those assumptions. And so in that last day of vertical articulation, there are a few tweaks, right, to the cut score recommendations of the committees, make sure that they are in a line grade to grade and that, that the assumptions that they made on the content um, were reasonable and were sensible. I'm going to follow up because I will admit that what I struggle with, when you go through your three-year process, determine the standards that uh, the blueprints and development in the review. I expect, I would expect that if a person's mastered, they would know all that stuff. That's not the case. What, what what you're saying is is that the person who masters has sufficient knowledge to move forward to the next subject. And that's I guess that's absolutely right. That is that's a I that's something a revelation that I had not realized before. So that when the cut score comes back, mm -hmm. it's seventy percent, something like that, total score. That's right. And you're saying they're mastered it. I kept on saying score is 70, they score is 60, and they've mastered it. Mm -hmm. But now, with your explanation, it helps me understand. So the definition for mastered in, in Tennessee is um, that students are, are have an extensive understanding and an expert ability to apply grade or course level knowledge and are prepared to move to the next grade level in Tennessee academic practice, right? So it's, it's not necessarily um, that they can do every single thing, right, but that they have shown a, a broad understanding of the content ready to engage. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Moran. This is very, very helpful. So we will see you tomorrow um, to review those cut scores for science, social studies, and alternate. Very good. I think it's now time to take a break. Uh, and we hold it to 10 minutes. We'll be back here at uh, seven minutes till.
School uh, counseling standards, Ms. Ward. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry. This is a result of me forgetting to make a couple of reminders at the start of our workshop. So forgive me, two minutes. Um, for members who are with us or at Lillian Online, we have a doodle poll that's out and just want to make sure everybody's reminded part of it's for the fall retreat, part of it's for our special called meeting that I referenced earlier that we're targeting for September. So just quick reminder, if you haven't taken that poll, please do so we can get those dates nailed down. And then secondly, we've got a couple new team members, some of which have actually started, some of which are gracious enough to be with us, even though they have not officially started. And they're all part of our, our growing legal team. So Angie's gonna introduce the folks that are with us today. Thank you, Angie, and welcome. We look forward to working with you. Okay, uh, Ms. Ward. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denisha Ward. I am the coordinator of College and Career Advising for the department. I will be presenting on school counseling. Of As always, we like to stay grounded in our best for all strategic plan, and school counseling falls within the student readiness part of that strategic plan. So our agenda today is just a quick introduction to my role um, and responsibilities at the department, um, a overview of school counseling across the state. Um, I'll be talking about our school counselor advisory council that's created as of this year, and then the school counselor regional table that you'll be interested in. Um, so as, as I said, my name is Denise, I'm the coordinator of college and career advising and that role uh, belongs to the Division of College, Career, and Technical Education with the department. Um, some of my key initiatives are career awareness, exploration, advising, and I really focus in on that advising space, um, thinking about grades as well. Um, I work very closely with another colleague of mine, Liza Ambrose, who is the Program Manager of Career, really focuses in on career a seamless transition and vertical line across all K through 12 as we think about career development for our um, ACT prep for students and educators. So in collaboration with the department is offering prep for students um, as well as free on professional development for educators who want to gain some strategies and resources as to how to integrate ACT. Uh, I also am focused on school counselor professional development, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation, um, as well as the K-12 school counselor standards policy and roster. Um, and I also collaborate with a few of our statewide advising programs such as Chief. I work really closely with Chief Hill and PBR. Uh, I am a former high school counselor, so that's why I love to advocate for my school. Um, I was a college counselor as well at a charter school in Memphis, Tennessee for a few years, as well as working in a community setting. Um, I am a school counselor by trade, so I got my master's degree from, in school counseling from the University of Memphis, and I'm currently John Cochran. So looking at school counseling across the state, um, as we really think about the implementation of school standards, um, overall, as you know, able to uh, interact with many of our school counselors in different areas across the state. Um, school counselors are really able to implement the school standards and spend 80% of their time in direct service 
And when I say direct service, I mean really providing individual or group counseling to students. Um, however, there are some districts that are still requiring counselors to engage in some responsibilities that are outside of the realm of One of those being testing coordination, uh, one of the largest ones that we have still an issue with um, school counselors having to. There are also school counselors who have to engage in substitute teaching or data entry for record keeping, which is not a part of school. Um, some of the recommendations that I hear from our school counselors on the ground is to make sure that our school leaders and district leaders are aware of the role of our counselors. Um, ensure that our school counselors are aware of the resources that they have right there in their school. If school counselors, we're not only, you know, uh, scheduling gurus and uh, transcript reviewers, but we can also provide counseling services to our students right there in our school. Uh, making sure that our administrators are aware of school counseling. So we know we are we're, we know what our job and our responsibilities are, but our school administrators also need to know so that they can know what what we are strategic responsibilities and what we are not. Four year plans, the implementation and use of these. So four year plans just to give a brief overview of what they are. Um, they are course planning tools that we use. Um, students are thinking about the courses that they will take. For um, so four-year plans are, are being completed in eighth grade by most of our districts and are updated either once or twice per year to the student in the 12th grade. The actual use of these plans is minimal, though. Um, student advising is not as in-depth as counseling would like for it to be, um, and the barrier for that is, is the um, it is definitely difficult to meet visually the students assigned to one school counselor. Would like to, and I know school counselors would like to be able to do that and provide in-depth student uh, academic advisement, but that's just not able to happen. So many that you have to use as well as look after uh, other responsibilities that counselors are um, charged with. Some of the recommendations for the field related to this particular issue um, is to start earlier, uh, thinking about building students' college base for course advisement sixth and seventh grade and not just starting in eighth grade. And then also, you know, asking our teachers and our other faculty members to also engage in conversations regarding course planning and um, You know, school counselors can't do that role solely alone. Um, and teachers are also a trusted adult within the school building that can provide academic advice. So counselor preparation. Um, so what counselors are in school than they are um, in service. Many of our larger districts are able to provide school counselors professional development that is counselor specific and content specific um, throughout the year. However, some of our smaller districts are able to provide that school counselor specific PD um, as they may not have like a school counseling supervisor um, or a supervisor that has actually been a school that is needed. Um, some of the recommendations from the field more so related to the EP standards here. Um, in having conversations with some of our counselor educators or our faculty members from some of our institutions that teach school counselors, uh, to say that, that the EPP do need updating. Um, our current standards only require that programs are allowed aligned with the American School Counselor Association or KCREP standards. Um, and KCREP is the accrediting body for all graduate uh, counseling programs. AFSCA, though, has a standard called the School Counselor Preparation Standard that are not only the counselor competence, but also includes health, which is a framework for the delivery of comprehensive school counseling program, um, the ethical standards that school counselors should adhere to, and mindsets and behaviors, which is basically a, a lesson plan or a curriculum of what we want students um, and what we want them to take with them into the next grade from K through 12. So 
I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the initiatives that we have from TDOE that are for school counselors. So uh, first, before I get into this, I just want to um, talk about the collaboration that we have and we support. So um, as I said, I belong to CMS, um, but CMS Family Supports is also a division that is within student readiness. Um, and so we recognize that the school counselor's work is not just focused on academic development and causing peer readiness, but it's also providing support to students um, socially and emotionally. Um, the coordinator of college and peer advising, I also collaborate with Christy Steele, director of mental health um, in the student and family supports division to ensure that all of the domains of the school counseling model. The director of mental health uh, assists in the school counselor advisory council as well as um, our professional development trainings that we will be implementing. Our school counselor advisory council um, we started this in this summer. We had our first meeting. Um, so we have school counselors from each of our economic and community development regions represented on our advisory council. Um, we have school counselors from each level, K through 12. We also have uh, faculty from some of our Tennessee So on the slide here, you can see some of the things that uh, the council members will be engaged in throughout their service year. Um, so we want to gain feedback from uh, our council members on the school counseling standards. We really want to ensure that uh, so if these need to be updated, uh, we want to get feedback from our school counselors that are on the ground doing the work. Um, our college and career milestone and the career, co career exploration course standards. Um, all of these are really looking at if these need to be updated, and if so, what does that look like? Engagement with other agencies, divisions, and offices. So school counseling touches all of these different uh, agencies. Uh, and this is not an exhaustive list, but we want to make sure that um, we make that connection between student and family supports and school counseling, Department of Labor and school counseling, mental health, teach, family resource centers, coordinated school health, to name it. Um, the school counselor advisory council members will also be asked to uh, present at our regional professional development trainings that we'll be having in the fall, starting in the fall. Um, they will be asked to present on a topic of their choice or if, so whether that be virtual school multi-tier systems of support, they will be asked for information to all of our students. So as I said, um, our school council regional roundtables, um, and this is not a new concept. I, in the past, these were called school council collaboratives, um, but these are going to be regional trainings that we will hold every uh, core region across the state. Um, and some of the topics are listed there. They include student support, uh, career exploration, and college advising. Um, and before we decided to implement any topics, we did a needs assessment um, with our school councils to whatever we presented was relevant to what they what their needs were. Some of the other trainings available to school counselors are available on the Best for All Central site, and they're listed there below. Student, supporting students who experience trauma, um, everyone plays a role in the system. Our, they're all available now. On. That's what I have for you today, and I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Questions for Ms. Ward? Ms. Farrell. Hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Really, really uh, enjoyed that. And I was fortunate a couple of years ago to have a Zoom with about three or four counselors um, from across the state that I had requested actually from TEA, and it was very illuminating. One question I have is about the service delivery model that school counselors are asked to execute. And is it realistic that we expect one individual to serve all of these roles? Have you had, have you and your counsel had any discussion about 
advocating for a team approach where maybe the school counselor takes a step back and is more of a administrator or player coach where you have different roles within a school to service all of those various areas that you mentioned. That's not a conversation that we've had, you know, we just started our council back, but that's definitely something that we want to talk about. The current school council ratios are very, still very high. One to 350 is still quite a large amount of person. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, using other referral services, which we do in, in our role as school counselors, we play every role. So we have to refer out to that school psychologist, that school social worker. But at the same time, that means that that district has, has to have those roles available for us to be able to do that. So um, I, that's something that we would definitely want to advocate for, um, as well as, uh, you know, thinking, thinking more about that school counselor. One, one additional point. Thank you for your answer. Um, I first joined the board one of our joint meetings with THEC, uh, prior Commissioner McQueen, uh, shared with us that across the state, there were some inordinate percentage of students who were, who demonstrated the competency, competency and ability for dual enrollment who weren't guided in that direction and that um, those students were missing out on that opportunity and the overwhelming majority of them were students of color. And so as we think about this division of time and roles and responsibilities, that thought sort of runs in the back of my mind that students are, I won't use the word suffering, but missing out on a uh, game changing opportunity for their futures as a result of this model that we're operating under that may be somewhat antiquated, so. No, I, and I agree. Thankfully, in, in my experience, as I've been designated as a dual enrollment coordinator in my class experiences high school council, great, but I know that that doesn't happen across the board. Um, I think it could be, again, that ratio, a lot of students, not enough time. But then I think, again, it also could be bias there, some things that we need to professional development um, and thinking about are we really targeting every that we could be for these opportunities. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. Evans. Thank you. So I remember when we voted on the 80 20. I'm trying to remember. Herman. So the School Council Association takes the one. What would be typical ratio? Um, so right now, uh, elementary is 500, and then high school, school high school. That is that across the board, and could there be one to 900? All right, so. I also remember added a responsibility at the time. I think there was really a robust career. I assume it was I really want to be a engineer. Better really be working.
working on your back in case prep. Or if you want to be whatever, here's your path to do it so you're not waiting. It's extremely important to what we're um, There were other things that were very responsibilities. I don't know if truancy was it, but I understand that it's some things that principals often tend to the council. Try to be handled. I'm going around the, the car in a long way. I didn't have personally a lot of confidence that 20% With fidelity, and I think that feared at the times that the principal, and I can understand it, has so few assets available to them to do things, including I think the test administration was a big deal. But and yet these things have to happen if we're going to ever achieve what we've been talking about getting. They, principal's fault, but he does need to comply. She, they need to comply with if, if this is a policy or is thing that I consider at the time at some point may want to go back and read this is because there is no no consequence really Reaching that point. So, you know, it's sort of like a, a guidance, sort of a. If a counselor was required to keep. Anyone would know that timesheet exists. I probably copy there somewhere. So more mindful of that point. All that being said, counselors are way underfunded, like school nurses, way underfunded. They're not there. So these kids aren't getting the value of early intervention help. Particularly about what to do once we get there. Can I can I say amen to that? And a couple of points on that. So, Chairwoman Hartgrove, uh, chair of the BEP recommendation committee, also serve on, as well as the House and Senate Education Committee chairs, its directors, uh, members of the school board, Ben Torres, uh, attorney from SBA. Each year, we, we go through a prioritization process, send top five. Last year, we actually sent six because we added the hold harmless recommendations to assembly on things. Every year that I've been on there, Counselors and nurses are two. I think they survey just went out. I suspect that when it comes back, counselors and nurses right there near the top of the list. Recommended because that number one to 350 or 500 or not. We want counselors to counseling. That's what the students need. So that recommendation will go to the assembly probably, if that's what the BEP recommendation committee can turn it over to Mr. James here in just a second. Encourage people to contact their legislator and let them know that they think important aspect of funded at the level. Also, I do know that um, we go through the process is very interested in uh, four-year plans, uh, education recovery, 
recommendation committee is the importance of setting those four year plans and you're saying start out earlier and i get that so i'm gonna ask mr james to uh talk about both of those I yes sir uh, thank you uh, mr vice chairman the, and it's true the, the education recovery innovation commission we for two solid days uh, actually just last week this was one of the the topics uh, certainly folks from all walks of life and so on are very interested in the paid to career process how do you how do you winnow down those responsibilities those interests and put them on pathway to success with bureaucratic steps getting in the way and it, these members are talking about what's already here you know and then we see but in reality they're not used that much um, so I, I will tell you, you you know what mr. Eby said is is entirely accurate and this was the first year by the way that I saw every one of the BEP review committee's recommendations at least be introduced as a bill and uh, the, the way it read out of last year's uh, video, it, it, it went through, it says, as the role and scope and responsibilities of school counselors has expanded in recent years, members of this review committee have reported strong stakeholder interest in decreasing the current ratio of students to school counselors. School counselors use, uh, utilize identified professional competencies to create comprehensive school counseling programs focused on students' outcomes, teach key competencies, and help students navigate these paths towards post-secondary success. The formula currently provides for school counselors that are an average of one to five, so it's one to three fifty for seven through four. And the BP Review Committee therefore recommends that additional funds be allocated within the formula to bring Tennessee's counselor to student ratio in closer alignment with national best practices. That was uh, judged to be sixty-four million five hundred and twenty-one thousand dollars as of last year. Issues were brought down to fifty. So on that issue, I'd say you've got a lot of things out. Vice Chairman Eby, I do want to add to the conversation, and I have to tell you all, it's a bit difficult when you're remote. A lot of the conversation at my end is very choppy. So if I say something that someone else has already stated, I'm going to apologize up front. But I do want to um, thank Ms. Ward for her presentation, and I think it behooves us to go back and dig into all of the recommendations that came from the survey that you um, collected from uh, individual counselors in the field, um, because there are some excellent recommendations that are coming forward through that work. And I think it behooves us to take that information and make a determination of how we would as a board, based on the responsibilities entrusted to us, take those and perhaps modify as an example you mentioned that the recommendation was to update the epp standards related to the counseling position there are also other recommendations that i, I think definitely need to go out to the districts and I, I would like to be i would like you to share if you could the game plan to ensure that the directors the administrators are aware of some of the other concerns that have been expressed by the um the counselor. So I'm going to stop and just allow you to respond to that question because uh, there are things that I think the districts need to be aware that this is the way that their counselors are feeling in general. And I don't know how those raw results look or how they've been um, summarized in a way that would be helpful for those in the field, the administrators to see. So again, I'm going to stop. And I apologize if you're speaking, I am not able to hear you. advice for this to bring together with the principal's advice um, because we want to make sure that school counselors 
schools and for But obviously we want to make sure, as I said, but we do want to make sure that So it is definitely something game plan. Um, again, I have not been able to hear your response, and I know that those that are in the room, especially uh, Dr. Morrison and Mr. Eby, could share with me what you what your response was. I do not want you to have to repeat it, but it's coming in that I virtually cannot hear you or it's very choppy. So thank you. I'm gonna give you all. I wanted to remind the board of a couple of things that are relevant to the presentation we just heard, and thank you so much. That was really helpful, and I look forward to having more conversations with you. This work that you're leading is so important um, to the state. So, as Mike pointed out, in 2017, this board did pass that 80-20 ratio in terms of the split of counselors' time. We had a lot of discussion. Mike was leading a lot of it at the time about, you know, whether we should have timesheets. How do we ensure that counselors will be able to sort of maintain that balance? Um, I'm looking forward to digging into some of the educator survey data, particularly from the counselors, and see if we can see through those survey responses how, how close we're getting to that 80-20 and some of the other information that I think might be um, in that educator survey that would help us understand where we need to go as a state to further get to that balance. Also, the four-year plans are in, in state board policies, so the middle school and high school policies have those requirements. And I'd love to continue to talk with you about how we make sure that they're more than just a box checked, you know, that they really are active living plans that inform the student's trajectory and course selection. Um, my notes. Then, two questions. So. The EPP standards, what's the timeline and the plan for updating those? I think you mentioned that they were out of date and that seems like one thing that we should be thinking about as a board. I'll ask you my other question. Oh, you have my question. Okay, go for it. Is it, okay, we're good. Um, I don't know how long it takes you, like I don't know the process of, you know, how long that would need to take, but um, if, if we could definitely do that within, that would be great. I don't know if that's feasible, but I mean, you'll probably be the one leading some of the engagement work and figuring out what the standards change need to look. And then for us, it'll be two readings. So, you know, it okay. probably is the better part of a year, but that's okay. why I'm wondering if we should get started probably. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> but that'd be great. We can work on that together. And then my other question is just more of planting a seed. And I know some of your colleagues have heard the, our team say this, but I just wonder, back to Daryl's point, I mean, even if we get to a 1 to 250 ratio, that's still not adequate for what we need in terms of college and career advising. And it makes me wonder, we've had lots of discussion about the add-on endorsement pathway that the department's beginning to offer, and this seems like a perfect place to add, you know, for teachers who want to take on that additional college and career advising, because, I, I mean, it, high school teacher myself, I mean, that was something that you were doing some informally anyway, but it just, it strikes me as an, a place that might be right for a model like that to add capacity. Absolutely. I mean, 1 to 250 still is, is quite a number if we really want for individualized college and career counseling to happen. Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be in a school where there was one to 76, and that was amazing. And that's what it should be, um, enough for us to be able to really, you know, work with students 9 through 12, creating an individualized for post-secondary education. So, absolutely, I think, and, and like I said, 
teachers are, you all do that anyway. You know, as a high school teacher, like you said, you do that anyway um, because you're a, a person that the kids trust. And they, you know, ask you, hey, what should I do when I get out of high school? And so, it, you know, if we can train teachers to do that or allow them to do that through an endorsement, I do think that that would be. Yeah, and just I would add, I mean, if you numbers, I'm sitting here wrong. We have 180 school days. Right, so if you're one to 350, one to 500, you have 180 school days that service. <laughs> you know, finite terms, how available you are. Um, and just to overlay the importance of this, I mean, we're, we're still, this is post remote, mid pandemic. I mean, level of emotional that inform how we decisions our classes, how we're looking at ourselves, how we're looking at how we're looking at what's in front of us. So I, yeah, I, that, I also would just uh, agree that we can't underscore how important this is and it needs a positive way. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ward. Any further questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, the master plan, uh, Ms. Owen. All right. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. I'm Amy Owen, Director of Policy and Research at the State Board, joined by my colleague, Ali Gaffey, Interim Director of Charter Schools. And we're going to briefly recap the 2020 through 2021 Board Master Plan, and then look ahead to the one for the upcoming academic year, which is up for first and final reading tomorrow. I'll briefly discuss the master plan of the previous year. You have in your member meeting materials a memo that goes into more depth about um, areas of achievement, what is on pro what is in progress and on track, and areas that encountered delays. And I'll talk about why some of that came about in just a moment. As you know, the board is required by law to adopt a master plan uh, governing the vision for education for each school year. And we also adopt five-year strategic goals. We had goals from 2015 through 2020, and last year we went through a very comprehensive stakeholder engagement process to set five-year goals for the 2020 through 2025 period. The master plan each year makes incremental progress toward those five-year goals. The goal, we had five goals. The first three are student-focused, a goal focused on elementary school, one on middle school, and one on high school, which leads into college and career preparation. Goal four is about high quality teachers and leaders. And goal five is more system focused about having uh, students having strong educational options in a variety of settings. Throughout that process, we tried to look for ways that the board could have influence through the policies and systems it establishes, things within the board's locus of control rather than necessarily um, big, broad, sweeping things that would depend on other agencies or districts or other folks to actually carry out. I will say that the strategic goals and the master plan for this past year were largely drafted prior to March 2020, when most of our lives changed very significantly. There were some changes that we were able to incorporate before the master plan was adopted that summer. However, there are also things that became more or less important along the way, um, and other things that became not as feasible to accomplish in a one-year time frame. Um, an example of something that really changed in scope, there was a goal about chronic absenteeism and convening stakeholders to talk about it and best practices for addressing absenteeism. Those are still important, but this looked much, much different in a virtual and hybrid setting than it would have um, if we were only in person and we were able to convene groups of principals to talk about strategies. That was not something that was going to be realistic. So we did make progress toward goals in ways like making sure the attendance expectations for continuous learning plans were refined over time for when districts were in a more hybrid mode. And finally, the master plan for this past year included many action steps that were regarding data collection and research to inform the policy work moving forward, which made sense given that it was year one working toward these five-year goals. We needed to gather some data and information and able to be able to move forward. So as I said, a more comprehensive memo is available with your meeting materials, but uh, if you have any questions about last year's progress, I know staff will be happy to answer them, Dr. Morris and herself, or any of the others on staff. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Allie to look ahead to this coming year. Thank you. 
Okay, so looking ahead to 2122, uh, this master plan includes updates to our benchmarks based on the feedback that y'all provided, as well as some new annual action steps that move us closer to our 2025 goals. So the updates further emphasize the need for ongoing data collection and analysis of our new and revised programs as a result of special session legislation and highlights a need for additional stakeholder engagement to develop, refine, and implement our policies over time. Specifically, the 21-22 master plan broadens our definition of reading to include all literacy skills and allows us to review multiple data sources to track progress. It also removes the statewide chronic absenteeism benchmark as Amy was just discussing and establishes a new benchmark focused on how our leaders impact teacher attention. So with that, I will pause here and open up for any questions. I have questions. This is, I guess, for Amy. This goes back to uh, 2020. Actually, it may be. Where are they? <laughs> uh, as I look at as I look at the master plan for last year, there are several items that appear that we are waiting on information, such as by June 30, 2021, produce a commission a report on LEA's implementation of current motion retention law and policy. Um, there was one on uh, begin to undertake relevant action based on report. Uh, this was associated with a study at Terra. This action's pending the approval of data requests. There's one on uh, ready graduate indicator, uh, advanced placement. Oh, uh, it says uh, by, 20, by June 30, 2021, commission report regarding district by district analysis of the current uh, access to preparation for and performance the ACT, military readiness, and early post-secondary environments. Uh, department approved the state staff this date in June 2021. Uh, continue to wait access. One in June 30, identify and begin to undertake relevant actions based on report, such as rule and policy revision, and it's uh, trying to get some access to data. So sure. I'm curious to know, uh, where, where we stand on that, because that's sure. obviously important. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that question. Um, obviously, it's very important that we maintain data security and data privacy and have appropriate safeguards in place. So the department has a protocol for uh, requesting access to data. Um, and in terms of recent data requests, we had a data request for school counselor survey data that the department filled uh, earlier this summer, Erica is now working to analyze that data now and will be able to share it out with board members um, and portions of that data as well in a more public fashion. We did recently receive permission to access the ReadyGrad data and that is the next project to be teed up looking at how access and success on those vary by district and by type of early post-secondary option. And then the final one about promotion and retention was a request that the Tennessee Education Research Alliance at Vanderbilt put into the department a um, little while back. I'm not quite sure of the status and I don't want to put our few department colleagues here on the hot seat, but we continue to follow up and make sure that uh, everybody understands the proposals, understands what data is requested and why and how it will be treated in a safe and secure manner. Thank you. Any other questions? I will just say thank you so much to all the board members for your ongoing feedback throughout the master plan process this spring. Your input is what gives us the vision and direction to help set the goals for the forthcoming year, and we really appreciate your time and feedback. Proposed licensure action. Todd Madison. Good morning, members. Uh, Todd Madison, staff attorney for the board. Uh, you have before you the staff or the board staff's recommendation for educator licensure actions. At this time, I'll take any questions or any items for discussion at tomorrow's meeting. Any questions for Mr. Madison or any requests to pull out any of the particular license? Thanks. 
Uh, any further comments? Uh, are you got any closing comments? Okay. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Hartgrove, if you can hear us, any, any closing comments from you? Thank you for calling on me and I can hear everybody now, thankfully. And I, I do want to thank everyone again, all the presenters, as you know, I, I'm very thankful for each of you. I think we did have some key learnings today as board members um, that will inform our work going forward. And again, I do want to thank Mr. Evie for chairing as vice chairman of the board. Um, he he's doing an, an excellent job and I have said many times before. One day he's going to make an excellent uh, chairman of the board. That's my uh, considered opinion. Um, but thank you all so much. I'm, I'm so sorry. I've not been able to join you all today and I will not be with you tomorrow. And again, uh, Mr. E.B., I know you'll do a great job chairing that committee for for the board. So thank you all so much and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and, and sitting here, it makes. Uh, me appreciate that much more what you do because you're trying to juggle everything at once and keep things moving is not the same thing. But uh, let me uh, thank everyone who participated today. I thought it was a very good workshop. I thought there was a lot of good exchange of information, some uh, better understanding, and that's the purpose of the workshop to interface and understanding. And I think it will help the board meeting go uh, more quickly tomorrow. I think we will have questions though. So. Uh, Look forward to that. And as of now, let's see, I have to um, declare that we, the committee of the whole, for the purpose of, purpose of the committee of the whole, has been fulfilled, and I declare it and the board adjourned.